Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Authors at Google. Uh, today we are in London, and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce everyone to author Susan Fletcher, uh, uh, who will be discussing her latest book, The Silver Dark Sea. Uh, Susan uh, is uh, the author of the best-selling book, Eve Green, and a winner of the Whitbread First Novel Award. Uh, she will be doing a reading, and then we will be discussing uh, the book. So, Susan Fletcher. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm only going to do a small reading. Um, I've chosen it because it comes from the start of the book, so it stands alone and doesn't need much of an introduction, but also I feel it's, um, it gives a strong flavour of my writing style. Uh, also, it sets up the novel quite nicely in that it presents the, the setting, which is an island, and the narrator is a woman called Maggie, and although she narrates the entire novel, she very rarely talks about herself, and this is one of the few occasions where she does give a little bit of information as to her life. So, uh, yeah, it's only short. I was born in land. I grew up where the wildest water was a puddle or a filmy pond in a park. Stories were harder to come by there. Trees bowed with the rain, and I found sparks of beauty in a flower bed or a pigeon's trembling, iridescent neck, but it was not enough. I hungered for more, always. I sensed there was something more than this life that I was living. And then I fell in love when I thought I never would, and I came to live on an island so that the lines by my eyes deepened and my hair thickened with salt, and ghostly white crabs flitted over my feet and buried themselves in the damp sand, and every sea was different from the sea that had come before it, pummeling or silent or brown-coloured and flat. And the man I loved would tell me his stories, in time, others did. They poured whiskey into my glass and settled beside me. They opened old books and said, look. I have known people who believed absolutely that a bird could talk our language and that the souls of their drowned friends could be found in the rattle and foam. They said, I heard her voice in the water. I did. Or, I felt his hand on my hand on that boat. You have my word. I do have their words, I do. I swagger with the weight of my wordy, priceless stash. And when I retell their stories now, I know that some people mock me or mock the island and they shake their heads at the impossibilities. A fishman, half fish, half man. Okay, I understand that, for I was briefly like them. I too had my private doubts, but so much has been lost and found. So many things have come to pass that have no explanation. And I half wonder if you cannot believe in such stories unless you have lived or stayed in a house by the sea, until you have lost washing to a sea breeze, or been bruised by the rain drumming on your anorak hood whilst trying to guide a dinghy in, in the blackest of nights. Until you have waited for a boat that does not come, or until that boat is found but its crew is not. It is another way of living and not all can stand it. There is the word salt bitten. It comes when hope is lost. So no, you cannot trust the sea, even now. Even with our satellites that tell us where we are, even with our sonars, radars, and computerized charts, even with our space travel and vaccinations and our atom bombs and cloned sheep, and even though we can make a new human life in a Petri dish, we still cannot breathe underwater. We cannot decode whale song. We cannot find a body when it goes overboard. We may know that a human heart has ventricles and can be shocked into beating again, but we do not have the words for what immense and extraordinary emotions it can feel, what heights and depths together. Love is too small a word, too small. A woman called Abigail Coyle used to tell me, we only know the foam, a sweep of her arm over the sea and I'd walk home understanding her. We do not know it all. That's what I'd set tell myself when standing waist deep in water. When I sat on a boat, I'd think of what was beneath me, the deep, deep chasms, the secrets, and the dark. Thank you. That's <laughs> lovely. Um, this book has so many different layers. I, I really enjoyed uh, reading it. One of the things that struck it was all of your depiction of nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a book about stories, but mm -hmm. one of the first thing that struck me is so much. You have so many animals and wind and textures and smells. Mm -hmm. um, 
were you ever in this part of the world, or is this uh, your own uh, imagination that's feeding us? I think that inclusion of nature to the point where nature is almost a character itself is probably a good example of me as a writer. My other books have been quite similar to that. It's nature and landscape that I feel most inspired by, that um, I feel I need to be around in order to get the ideas. Uh, I was living um, up in Scotland for a long time in the Highlands um, and on the coast and whilst technically this book isn't officially set anywhere, I was very keen to make sure that um, the island was a fictional island and the country that it was off the coast of was a fictional country in a fictional sea. It had to be based on something. So um, when I was living on the Scottish west coast with a view of the Scottish islands, that probably was my inspiration. I was really lucky I lived in this little cottage where there was the garden and then a gate at the end of the garden and then there was the beach and the sea. So it was pretty easy to go down in the morning and actually pick up mussel shells and I would see seals and otters in the my house. So something like that when you're as lucky as I was to live somewhere like that, it, it has to go into the book. It gets infused and soaked up. And I went to a lot of the islands as well and kept diaries when I was out there. So, yeah. So, so do we read anything into the idea that the island's name is Parla, that kind of like a play on talking? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, the main theme of the book is storytelling and why we may choose to tell stories. Um, how storytelling can be a very powerful thing to do. So uh, the fact that the island is called Parlo is exactly that. And various other islands have names that also um, are a play on the different ways that we speak. There's an island that features called Merm, and it's an island on which life was cut short. The last few inhabitants were lifted off and moved away. And Merm felt, what you're one step away from a murmur, it's like you can no longer talk. The island's stories are virtually gone because the inhabitants have gone and there's very few people left to tell the stories of that island now. So I wanted the name to reflect that to be a, a almost a word that means to talk, but it got shortened because the stories are gone. So I have been playing around with names in that respect. Yeah. And so when you're talking about stories, the, the, the pivotal story in this book is that a man washes up. Yeah. And how the inhabitants of this island choose to view him. And one of the um, constructs in your book that I thought was fascinating is that you provide a uh, family tree yes. of your characters in the, in the front of the book. So if you open up the book, there's this family tree, but then it's not until like you've actually, well, at least for myself, finish the end of the book, you go back to kind of see what the relationships were and then the entire tone of the, the, the book changes when you realize that it's two sisters yeah. or a, a boyfriend and a girlfriend or a widower or older folks. This, the story that you read then transmutes. Mm -hmm. um, was that on purpose? Did you do that or is that just something that came out of the art? Of no, writing? that's something that probably just happened organically. For a long time that wasn't going to be a family tree, um, but I needed one to write the book. I had my map of my fictional island on the wall with all the beaches and coves and who lived where and where the shop was and where the school was. And then next to it I had the family tree so that I knew everybody inside out. And it was only really when the book was going forward to the publishers that I thought there's 20 odd characters here. Um, and everybody's interrelated. It's one of the important aspects of the book and the island is that everybody is linked in some way, if not by blood, by feelings. It's a very tight community, for better or worse. And I thought it's important that there's no doubt in the reader's mind who's who. So really, it was for practical reasons that the family tree went in. But I liked the sense that gave the book of being perhaps an older book than it is, some sort of almost like a fairy tale, some weighty tome, the old the old books where you would sort of creak the page open and there'd be family trees. I remember the ones when I was little that you could sort of pull out bits of paper and sort of they unfolded and you got a sense when a, I feel when you start a book that has a map in the beginning or, or a family tree, you feel a saga is coming. It gives it a gravitas perhaps. So I actually was pleased when we did decide the family tree was necessary. I felt it gave it extra weight. Would you ever put the map of the island in? I thought about it. I did think about it. Um, but in the end, 
it was a collective decision that probably we wouldn't and that hopefully my language has done enough to bring the island to life and I would like to think that the reader has their own idea of the island um, and can picture it themselves and in that respect I wouldn't want my map to go against what they have conjured up the island to be. It's we're all different, we all bring ourselves to a book, so it could be an island the read themselves have visited. So, yeah, we'll see. Could always put it in later on, but... Okay, next edition. Next edition, yeah. Uh, another aspect of this book is is the, um, the emotional content. Mm -hmm. I know I, we've talked about this earlier. Every time I read this book, I cry. <laughs> and to the point where I could only ever read it on the subway because that's a 20 minute ride and so I could only have 20 minutes worth of emotion in my head at any one time um, and then uh, I reread the parts of the book you know, in preparation for this event and I still cried so are you doing that on purpose or is this something that the reader brings to the, the to your book I don't set out to think I really want the reader to cry because that would make me mean. But I think it's I think it's a good thing if I get emotional and if I cry during the writing of it, and I did. I, there were parts that I found really hard to write and I needed a cup of tea and a good tissue afterwards and a good cry. And I think if I have been that connected to the novel, I'm doing my job. I, I don't think it's possible for a reader to be moved by a book unless the writer has really believed in it. You know, when I revert into the reader mode and I'm reading other people's books, I feel I can tell quite quickly if their heart has been in it and if they care about the characters. Um, and I've just, I lived with these people for nearly three years. So, um, yeah, I, there were parts that I, I did get very upset in. So, in the nicest possible way, I'm really glad that you cry <laughs> because it makes me feel that I've managed to sort of hand that over, um, convey, I've managed to convey my feelings, I've managed to make these people real enough for you to be upset by what they feel and think. And yes, invariably every reader brings themselves to a novel and their experiences and there could be things in this book that a reader has experienced themselves firsthand. So obviously to them that will be an incredibly personal experience, whilst others probably just imagine. But um, yeah, it's it is always good to know if someone has been moved. I feel like I should always apologise, but, <laughs> but also part of me is very glad when I hear that someone has cried at what I've written. I, what is interesting about that and, and your explanation of it is when I've read uh, other reviews of this book or uh, of your work, people uh, hold you to account for that. And, and, and then it kind of goes into that strange discussion about, well, this is women's fiction. Women have, women's, women writers have an emotional content that uh, is inaccessible or harder to access than, say, a man's writing. What are your thoughts on that? I don't really understand a lot of that, that viewpoint, really. The women's fiction, I, I don't really know what it means. Um, there is the argument that women are more likely to pick up a book written by a woman and a man is more likely to pick up a book written by a man. But some of the most sort of emotionally intelligent books I know are written by men. You know, they can hold their weight in that <laughs> respect. Also, there are an awful lot of female writers who can write thrillers and something that's fast-paced and sexy and violent. You know, the, the crossover is huge and I think pigeonholing is, is a mistake and it confuses me. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to think that I only write for women. I, I, when I think of who I write for, it is sort of, it's, it's gender neutral. Um, I'd like to think that I can be enjoyed by both men and women in my writing. So it's not, it, it's, it's not a label that I care for much and you hear it a lot. So it's quite frustrating. I wouldn't want to have my book just passed by on the shelf because I happen to be a female writer who's written about relationships. And I don't think that not appeal to men. Tricky. It is. It is tricky. Um, you you were uh, almost selected for an Oprah book club, mm -hmm. and sometimes her book listings have an emotional content that you wouldn't necessarily find in like the New York Times bestseller okay. list. Um, 
what was that like being almost selected for Oprah? I mean, not that sounds like a strange question, but did they approach you? No, I, I, all I know is that there was a review in O Magazine, um, and that that's what we'd been hoping for. We'd been hoping to get, as I'm sure any writer was published in the States, um, sort of hoped for that. And the book that was considered Eve Green, my first book, um, that had been on the Rich and Judy book club at that time, which was is sort of the British equivalent. Um, it, the advantage of things like that is that it just opens you up to a far wider audience. Uh, and that's really, I think, is all a writer can ask for, that you get read um, and, and possibly talked about. I mean, I can cope with bad reviews and people not liking the book. That's, that's what happens. That's part of the nature, you know, the nature of this beast. But the worst thing would be is if something just never got read or talked about and gathered dust. So really any um, outlet through which your book can be pushed so that other people read it who might not normally have done, that's, that can only be a blessing. So um, that's why I was particularly grateful for the Richard and Judy um, episode. And you know, if, if, Oprah, if Oprah had read it, that would be amazing. <laughs> but um, no, I was just happy to simply have been reviewed in the magazine. But yeah. And, and so the, the New York Times, uh, not New York Times, the, uh, the Sunday Times associated your prose with that of Sylvia Plath. Mm -hmm. How was that day when you read that? That was. That was kind of amazing, and I had to sort of think, it is just the writing, isn't it? It's not my life they're comparing it to. <laughs> you know, I'm all right. <laughs> um, no, that was great. I mean, that's you, somebody you grow up reading and studying at school to think that there's even one person out there who finds that your work echoes hers. But you sort of pinch yourself. It feels like uh, it's a huge honour, slightly frightening, uh, but ultimately it's one of these things you sort of put in a box and come back to you when you're having a bad writing day, when you think you can't do it anymore, or you've made a mistake and you should do something else. You think, well, actually, somebody wants to compare me to Sylvia Plath, so to one person at least, I should probably continue writing. I have a little thought box like that where I keep the good things, <laughs> keep me going <laughs> through the dark days. Do you have a process when you write? Do you like only write in the morning or only write? I'm best in the morning. Morning? Yeah, early, early. So I sort of from sort of seven o'clock onwards is my best time. And then I hit the afternoon slump, like I think most people do, it's about three o'clock. Mm -hmm. And that's when I try to go out and do something physical or be with people because one of the huge downsides of this job, there's nobody else in it but you. So you can have hours, days, just you and a laptop. And I choose personally not to really talk about what I'm doing with other people. I find it, it's a very, it's such a personal thing writing a book and it's so delicate. Really, up until the time it comes out, it still feels like one hard prod or kick and it would fall apart. It's only in the later stages I have any confidence that it would survive a, a grilling or a bad comment or anything like that. I feel so protective. You know, I want everyone to keep away. <laughs> it's a little baby. No, so I'm, I'm really secretive about what I do. The downside of that being that nobody gets involved. So it's a world of one for a long time. And my, my easiest writing days and the days I'm writing best is when I do have an outlet sort of to, to be with people, a social outlet. I've, I've done lots of other work on the side of writing. So I've worked in pubs and coffee shops and and that's actually the best, for me, the best routine I can have because it gives your writing brain a complete rest and you're surrounded by people, you're stimulated, you can chat, you have colleagues, you're meeting people in the job that you do. So that is, a, for me, the perfect balance. It is interesting that you say that because um, one of the fascinating things about the Silver Dark Sea is you're spot on with how these different characters talk. You have young men, you have children, you have older people, and it's, and they're not the same voice. I mean, you really do have like an old man's voice when you're writing about the old man, and you have a, the child's voice when you're writing about the, the, the young girl on there. Do you work the bar when like, you're working in the pub or whatever? Do you actually, I'm gonna listen to him, I'm gonna, pick up on him. I mean, you might not necessarily grab yeah. the story, but you might pick up the presence, you might pick up the sense. 
I'm glad you said that because I actually feel that dialogue is one of my weak spots. And I've <laughs> the past three books has been not much dialogue in my other books because I don't feel that I can handle it very well. But this book, I knew there would have to be a lot of dialogue, a lot of very important information comes out through conversations. So it was really, for the first time, it was something I had to really address. And I do think working in bars and, and, and being in public places a lot helps. You don't necessarily eat, eavesdrop deliberately, but things do go in. The, the child's voice was easy. I've always been able to do that. I think probably I still, <laughs> in my head, I probably still talk like a child. Um, so I just to put out, that out. Writing as a, as a man would be very hard, getting inside a male brain. How many women can do that? <laughs> um, so this, again, was the first taster I've had of trying to imagine how a man would respond to certain situations. Um, and I hope I've, I've managed to do that. Um, I think, as with ev everything, when it comes to writing, I think you just need to expose yourself to as, as many experiences as possible, and and you soak up, knowingly or otherwise, the information. So, being in a male-heavy pub probably helps. H hearing men talk all the time probably helped. <laughs> well, it's interesting not to give too much about away about the book. Um, mm. uh, so the man who yep. washes up. Yep. Um, uh, has lost all sense of who he is or where he's from or even yeah. where he is. Yeah. And until he gets his voice back, mm -hmm. the other characters interact with him and he's a cipher. Mm -hmm. I found that thrilling to have a male character in a book who doesn't talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the idea that you're talking about, you know, having, speaking in a male voice, to have a male character pivotal to the mm -hmm. plot who doesn't speak yep. was... Refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, and but then all the characters kind of imprinted on him what their experience yeah. with the men in their lives have been. Like the, so, the widower, the people who have lost mm -hmm. sons or brothers, mm -hmm. saw in him what they had lost. Mm -hmm. So the idea that he he was a stand-in mm -hmm. for their their loss or what they felt was missing from yeah. their lives was very interesting and that, but then when he does recover he understands this mm -hmm. he, he understands what they have done mm -hmm. but i do find it interesting that the the one there's one character in there when the guy the man who has washed up starts to become communicative an older man tells him mm -hmm. what does he tell him mm -hmm. what does he you say it don't so, well, he advises, basically, this. To, I should probably just do a little summary, but the book starts with a man being washed up, as Kate was saying, on the beach, and he has no memory. And the beach he washes up on is known in the island's folklore as being the place where, many years ago, the fish man was seen. And the fish man was a merman, effectively, um, half man, half fish, who lived off the waters, and he would come ashore and grow legs and live amongst the people at a time when he was needed and he would restore hope and then after a full moon's turn he would return to the sea and be gone forever. So um, this man comes ashore with no memory, the island is grieving, they've lost um, one of their own several years ago and no one's really recovered from this lost loss, he drowned at sea and his body was not found. So he is, he is a, a catalyst, his arrival shocks everyone into having to face up to what they've lost. And it's a question of who do they want him to be? Do people want him to be perhaps some guy who fell off a boat and knocked his head and got washed up by chance? Or do they want him to be a character out of folklore that who has come to make their lives better? So it's about projecting perhaps your hopes and what you want from the world. So, um, but no, the... the, the the scene, I know exactly the scene you're alluding to, there's a, one of the islanders, an old man, a blind man, he senses that this fish man knows far more than he's letting on. And the old man just says, don't tell anybody anything, let people make up their own minds about you, keep the truth to yourself. Um, that's the scene I see you're meaning. Um, and that comes, I think, about a third into the book. So by that point, you think, right, we know that there is a story here, and invariably stories can't stay untold, really, in a novel. So 
the climax of the book is finding out if he is the fish man or not and who he is. Do you read or have you read a lot of fairy tales in your life? Did you read them as a child and then return to them or is this just a structure that you just always held? No, I've always been interested in fairy tales and how they span the world. Every culture has fairy tales or its equivalent. Uh, and I think an island community, or from my experience, an island community holds their their folk fairy tales and, and myth closer than perhaps we do on the mainland because it's a more precarious way of life. You're more willing to be slightly superstitious if you live in a very hostile environment because you have more to lose. So why not perhaps be superstitious and have odd little rituals if you believe it may go some way to keeping you safe? Uh, so I knew that in my fiction line, folklore and, and fairy tales and, and strange beliefs would have more weight and be more credible in a way. I just find them really fascinating and how often they will repeat themselves in different ways and in different um, cultures, there'll be echoes. Uh, and I did quite a few reading of fairy tales for this book. I wanted it to feel like a fairy tale in itself. Um, the way my structure is that there is a chapter and then a little made up on my part, little fairy tale from the island, and then a chapter and then a fairy tale. Um, and I wanted to suggest to you by doing this that we may think the idea of a, a half man, half fish coming ashore and growing legs is just impossible and extraordinary and obviously never going to happen. But then similarly, I think it's amazing. The modern technology we have these days is amazing. You could argue that how people survive immense loss or immense heartbreak and they carry on and continue to be nice people might be just as extraordinary. But the fact we have language and imagination and that our bodies work as they do is, is amazing. So towards the end of the book I just wanted to fuse together what exists and is real and what we might consider mundane and what is extraordinary and almost magical and actually blur the two so that everyday life can be seen perhaps with kind of eyes and we give ourselves more credit than we did previously, if that makes sense. Well, it does make sense. I, I was struck when I read the book that um, the end of the fairy tale of this story is not the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And so did you reach a point when you were writing this where you go, uh, do I end it here or do I make it more, I hesitate to say modern or real, yeah. but yeah. It, you know, the, the, the full moon comes yeah. and everyone is expecting an event. Yeah. And so the characters have to decide what event mm -hmm. they're going to provide to the mm -hmm. rest of the community. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that process. I knew, I knew from the word go who this man was and I knew eventually what his story would be and why he came to the island. What I didn't know was what his legacy would necessarily be to the islanders that he ends up leaving behind. Who reacts in what way and, and I wanted the island to be a better place for him, his arrival and departure, but it was difficult to know where to end the book. And it was tempting to not have everybody in a better place for it, the majority but not all. Um, but it's difficult, I don't want to give too much away, <laughs> I'm skirting around the ending. Um, I feel that I have come to the conclusion that's right for the book. For a while it wasn't going to be a happy ending, um, but then I thought it has to be. I'm talking about fairy tales, I'm talking about um, the beauty of life really. and. I think if I was the reader and this was somebody else's book that I'd picked off the shelf, I would want the happy ending. I would want things to be okay. And that's not giving it away because hopefully up until the last page, the reader won't be able to really guess at what the happy ending will be. But I, I feel that's the ending the characters deserved, actually. They deserved to have it work out for them. They've been through a lot. <laughs> I wanted it to be all right for them in the end. So, but your endings are always quite difficult because as the book progresses, you start to think maybe it's not going to be as you originally planned, but in this instance, it mostly was. 
many writers talk about when they finish the book or they finish the story, um, especially or if they're just uh, originally imagining it, uh, there's a process of mourning mm -hmm. because you're in this community, although it's just mm -hmm. in your head. When you finish this book, what happened to you? I slept a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually, the, the, the strangest part for me was the final month of writing it because my deadline was the end of September of last year and it got to about mid-August. And I remember thinking, I have got to really work hard to make this deadline. And I wanted to. I felt ready to hand it over. So I worked. I sort of cut out my social life and went to ground somewhat and just had six weeks of intense work where I'd really only sort of have perhaps five, six hours sleep and then an hour off. I mean, it was really... And towards the end of September, I just thought they were real. I remember getting in the car and going out to buy a pint of milk and thinking I was on the island and thinking I was going to the island shop. <laughs> oh, <laughs> someone needs to get out more. <laughs> um, I thought briefly, I, I went to the pub when it was all, I'd handed it in, I went to the pub to have a drink and I thought I saw one of my characters there in the car park. Oh, no, God, God, <laughs> have a break. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was an incredibly intense experience. And then afterwards when I handed the book in, there is relief because you do feel like you've lived with 22 people for three years. You, you want time away from them. But it always, there is a morning. There is a morning. You do miss them. I still miss characters that I wrote in other books. Like um, who? Uh, in, it's called Witch Lights mm -hmm. here, but it, in the States it's called The Highland Witch. Um, the main character in that, I, um, I missed her. I really liked her. I liked writing about her. And uh, my ending for that book saw her in the landscape that I was living in and I had a, a very definite idea of where I was leaving her out on the moor and the road to go to the tra train station kind of went past where in my mind I'd left her. So every time I drove to the train station I'd be, that's where she is, even though she's completely made up um, mentally. They, they don't feel fictional. Strange job. So a witch light is about 17th century Scotland mm -hmm. and the role of women in the community as well mm -hmm. as the waves of social change that comes through with the religion or governments or how things are, are constructed. Uh, what was the genesis of that book? Because it seems like your, your fiction is, is rooted in a uh, geographic place, even though it might not be a real place, mm -hmm. but you write about the coast of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Were you living in Scotland when you wrote? Which yeah, thing? yeah. I went up, I've always wanted to see the Highlands, went up to the Highlands, and it was while I was up there simply visiting that I heard about this story uh, of the Glencoe Massacre, Glencoe being fantastic glen on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, and in 1692, the government troops massacred a lot of the population there. And I knew that much of the story, but what I didn't know was, again, it's to do with folklore, actually. Uh, they say there was a woman living in the Glen at the time who was a witch, and she predicted the massacre was going to happen. And she ran down into the Glen that night to warn the McDonald's who were living there. Um, and whether they heeded her warning or not, the reality is that there were probably a couple of hundred McDonald's living in the Glen at the time, but under 40 actually died that night. So a lot fled, a lot did escape and get away. So, you know, I put two and two together and thought, yeah, they did heed her warning and she was real. And so I wanted to explore her and the idea of witchcraft and marginalised women, people on the edge of society really interest me, people who are a bit kooky and different and are treated accordingly. So, yeah, I enjoyed writing about her. I, when I read Witch Light, um, I found it hard to breathe because the, the one character is incarcerated yeah. in a terrible, yeah. dank prison and her only uh, uh, contact with humans for a very long time is the, it's like an inquisitor, mm -hmm. don't, they didn't have inquisitors in the UK, mm -hmm. but he, he has a religious background and he comes up and he's very anti woman in a mm -hmm. way that seems to fit with the times. Mm -hmm. But then he grows to appreciate her intelligence and her capacity for survival. Yeah. Um, this capacity for survival is also a thread throughout the Silver Dark Sea. Mm -hmm. People are surviving um, beyond what they thought they could, yeah. whether it's loss or living on this harsh island. Um, 
is that a, a theme that, that fascinates you? The, the idea of surviving life? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, surviving it, you're living it, but you're also yeah. you're living through it. Yeah. Yeah, digging deep and finding reserves and having to carry on. I think I am really interested in that. It's only now that I've written the fourth book, but I can see in all four books I've written, that's a theme that appears in all of them. It's about people who experience real difficulty at the very least, um, up to tragedy and heartbreak. And what choice really do you have except to carry on, to find an inner reserve and to continue to try and see the good in the world and make a difference to it and 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 carry on. I do find that a really interesting topic and hopefully quite a uplifting one for a novel, this idea that you can go through darkness and emerge the other side, um, possibly even a person than you were before the darkness happened. It is, it's, I mean, it's, it would be interesting to write a book from a point of view of someone who doesn't survive a, a darkness in that way. Um, but it might not be particularly happy reading, because <laughs> it might not sound that well. But um, yes, it's, it is a theme that interests me, particularly just sort of a, a woman's fortitude um, and carrying on regardless. Yeah. So the Silver Dark Seas, there are 22 people on the island. A lot of these are women. And it's interesting, they all have their own type of darkness. It's not mm -hmm. just, sometimes you, you read a, a book and it's one event and it's terrible and it's dark throughout. Mm -hmm. um, the women in on Parla have different shades. Mm -hmm. Like there's the, there's, an un, there's several flavors of unrequited love. There's mm -hmm. several flavors of being at the end of one's life, mm -hmm. wait, you know, wishing that someone had um, either joined you or was still with you at yeah. the end of your life. Um, do you, tell me about creating that world. Is that something that just came out, or is that a point that you wanted to make, that the darkness is not the same color for everyone? Yeah, I want everybody. It was a quite a difficult job I had because I wanted everybody on the island, even though there's a, quite a few people, I wanted them all to be as real as each other and to not favor one person over another. And everybody's different. Everybody has experienced loss on this island, mainly because they were all related to, or friends with, or loved the man Tom who died four years before by drowning at sea and not being found. So everybody has lost a son, or a brother, or a brother-in-law, or a husband, or a child. He was so many things to different people, and consequently the different relationships have left different feelings of loss. But then I wanted more than just loss of him so there are people who miss their youth or feel they've wasted it or people who wonder if they should ever have got married or people who think I wish I had done um, and people have lost the old man's lost his sight so he mourns the fact he can no longer see his wife's face anymore so everybody has lost something from varying varying degrees but um, Yes, the, the idea of the new different shades of loss is lovely because it felt like that. So there are some people who, when I think of them as characters, I feel they've got this real black sort of sense of loss, something very heavy, which, and they were the difficult people to write about. And then there's a sort of more superficial layer, le layer that's not necessarily a lighter loss to carry, but one that I can recognise more readily. And so I felt I was more able to describe it. It was less of a challenge to describe that kind of loss. So it was trying to get the whole spectrum, the whole range, from effectively the death of a husband or a child, right up to just losing light or jewelry or something, all, you know, everything, the whole gamut, so hopefully that's coming across. The book um, circles around a lot, so you hear the same story throughout the book from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had the, the perception as I was reading it of a circular movement, almost mm -hmm. like like a what, like a whirlwind or mm -hmm. a, a tidal whirlpool, pool, yeah. a tidal pool, yeah. round and round. Um, was that a, a construct that you sought to achieve, or is that just something that came out as you told the story from the different points of view of everyone on the island? Did you say, "I'm going to here's a story and." I'm going to provide all different facets of the story, mm -hmm. or it just kind of showed up. A little bit of both, I think. 
I did, I wanted, if you have one big event that a lot of people took part in or witnessed, then they're all going to see it from a different point of view. And I wanted, again, this idea of being fair to the, the community and everybody having their viewpoint and their chance. I wanted to sort of present all the different ways this event happened. And therefore, for the reader, making it feel like a real sort of 3D event. They can see every corner and facet of it because everybody has thrown in their two pence worth. Um, but it did, after a while, it took on sort of a nature of its own and this idea of um, this sort of whirlpool image that that you described, that I think was more organic than anything. I think it was, yeah, that came of its own accord. So I know you don't like to talk about what you're working on. So, <laughs> so what are you working on? <laughs> <laughs> I feel I feel at the moment like I'm a chicken sitting on different eggs to seeing which one will hatch. I've got several ideas um, that I'm just starting to sort of feel my way around and it's not just about the ideas I have but whether the time is right for one more than the other really um, and it's difficult you've got to sort of work out how long you think each book's going to take you and and one's life traje trajectory and, and it, I think the bottom line is I think the next book I write would just be the one that I feel most passionate about I could overthink it for a long time. Which one would suit the market the best? Or which one do other people, people want me to write? Which one is most similar to the books that are selling well? That kind of thing. But actually, I think you write what you love. You write what you feel ready for and you have the appetite for. Because it goes back to one of the opening questions. That will translate through to the reader. Um, I, I don't think, really, the, the books get written with that. I mean, invariably, they do. But you have to... You have to really want to write it. You have to put yourself into the novel and give it a heartbeat. Otherwise, it just won't come through to the reader that there's a heartbeat at all. And there's nothing worse for me as a reader to have a cold book. So um, we'll just see what my instinct tells me. And that's probably what I'll write. <laughs> do you ever walk away from an idea? You you say, at this, I'm going to do this. It's here we go. And yeah, I have done really recently, <laughs> <laughs> which is really hard. It's about six months worth of work. And it's not been binned, I will go back to it. But it has been put on the back burner. I looked at it and I thought, I feel I've lost my way. I feel like I'm searching around almost in a panicky way now. And that is, there's no, no good is ever going to come from that. So I'm putting it to one side, looking at my other ideas. And it could be that just thinking about other ideas takes my mind from that so that when I come back to it, I'll have clear eyes again and I can see where I went wrong. But it's hard, it's hard putting that amount of time into a project only to think it's not the right one. You feel you've wasted those six months. The reality is you haven't. You know, I will be able to strip that for parts if nothing else. And hopefully I'll be a better writer for having walked away from something. But there was a couple of days where I felt quite sorry for myself on that one. <laughs> Do you do other types of writing? Like sometimes uh, writers will clear the palette with an essay, or they um, they keep a journal, or yeah. even just long, long letters to friends. What, what I love writing letters. I'm still a big believer in the actual letter, not an email or a text, but you know the nice writing paper with a nice pen. Um, I write poetry that no one will ever see, but it's good for me. That feels like my palate cleanser. Um, I don't tend to write essays. I keep journals, particularly if I'm travelling. I'll always keep a travel diary. I sort of do that almost more than I take photos. I'm a big believer in um, travel journals. So that's my outlet. It could well be that the time will come for essays or reviewing or journalistic work, but I haven't got to that stage yet. You return to your travel journals? Like, uh, whatever, yeah. you, um, what's your oldest travel journal? Um, probably when I... <sighs> Probably when I went, the one that springs to mind is when I was 20 and I went backpacking to Australia and New Zealand. And that's, that's you know, you look back and all the things I was worried about age 20. You know, I haven't said girl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, that's probably the oldest. There's, I have some diaries from school days, you know, around GCSEs and things. For 15, 16, I kept diaries. When I went to sixth form and discovered boys, I was keeping diaries, you know. Um, it's just kind of laughable now, but... I didn't write them thinking one day they might be useful for novel writing. I just kept them because it made sense to me to do that. But you look back and think, yeah, I could 
one day strip that for parts and change names <laughs> <laughs> and deny all knowledge of it ever coming from me. So, so those old journals are useful then? They could be. Certainly the travel ones are, yeah. yeah. And, and when you do a travel journal, um, do you sit down at the end of the day and, dear diary, today I went here, here, and here, or is it what you've seen, or just how do you transcribe a journey into a journal? Some of them are just bullet points so that I remember when I'm 95 exactly what I did in that place. But there are sort of ones too where I would just pour out homesickness or um, just what takes me. I try not to think about it too much, it's just what happens. The one that I kept when I was 20 is hilarious because I'm just writing about the sandwich I ate and the number of the bus I took. And then it's a bit right, I have to now write like a proper writer. So I start being more descriptive <laughs> about five pages and then I go back to sort of, you know, how I need a new pair of shoes. And actually the interesting part is, is the sort of everyday frippery, not this sort of attempt at being poetic about what the Blue Mountains look like. It was the interesting bit is about waiting at a bus station or um, riding the ferry across Sydney Harbour. That's more interesting. The sort of small observation things, I think, are the most important bits to get down now. That's what I would do if I was travelling tomorrow. I would just do the tiny observations that I would make I think, bring a place alive for them. Yeah. Do you have any plans to travel soon? I, yeah, I think this year I need to. I've got itchy feet. It's been four years since I sort of went far. So, okay. You could go anywhere, where would you go? Um, I would, actually I would love to see more of the states, I would love to go up into Canada, I'd love to go up to Alaska, so all of that, that would be grand, I'd love to do that. Um, India, my mother's come back from India recently, I'd love to see India. Um, and I, I've travelled quite extensively in Africa and that, that, you know, it's not easy to do, but I loved it. I felt I grew a lot as a person there, so I'd like to go back there. Well, thank you so much for your time and coming. Thank Thanks. you so much for this thank book. Thank you for asking me. This is uh, all we have time for. Uh, thank you, everyone.